Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 9th, 2013, and my guest is Arnold Kling. Arnold is a writer and teacher. He blogs at Ask Blog. He is the author of numerous books and is a former blogger at EconLog. This is his 11th appearance on Econ Talk, if I've counted correctly. And we're going to be talking about his new Amazon single, an extended essay in digital form called The Three Languages of Politics. Arnold, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you. I bet it's not as many as 11, but uh, that would be – I'd be impressed. I think it is. I love your book. Uh, it's only about 50 pages, by the way, and it's it's only $1.99. just want to set people's minds at ease. Uh, it's a bargain at twice the price. I would say the main theme is that when we talk politics, we often talk past one another because we have very different frameworks or lenses for how we look at the world. And you identify three different axes or lenses or heuristics, as you call them, for seeing the world. What are those three? Okay, so there are three things that set uh, aside oppositions or the good and the bad. So what I claim is that progressives – organize the good and the bad in terms of oppression and the oppressed, and they think in terms of groups. So groups of people, certain groups of people are oppressed and certain groups of people are oppressors. And so the good is to align yourself against oppression and uh, you know, the historical figures that have improved the world have uh, fought against oppression and overcome oppression. Um, the second axis is the one that I think conservatives use, which is uh, civilization and barbarism. The good is civilized values that have uh, accumulated over time and have stood the test of time, and the bad is barbarians who try to uh, <clears throat> strike out against those those values and destroy civilization. And the third axis is the one I associate with libertarians, which is freedom versus coercion. So the good is individuals making their own choices, um, contracting freely with each other, and the bad is coercion at gunpoint, uh, particularly on the part of governments. So let's apply it to an example you do in the book, which is immigration. Uh, Talk about how the three different languages would work with that very sensitive political issue. Okay, so a um, in the United States today, a um, a progressive might uh, think of the uh, um, the uh, people who have crossed the border uh, from Latin America as an oppressed group, uh, and native white Americans who are uh, hostile to immigrants as oppressors, and so they would be favoring allowing uh, allowing these immigrants to come in uh, there with, with one sort of caveat in that they uh, also think that uh, w- would classify uh, low skilled working Americans uh, as among the oppressed group and they wouldn't want to set uh, create conflicts where bringing in more immigrants hurts uh, low skilled Americans. For the um, for conservatives looking along the civilization barbarism axis, they think that having a border and a well-defined border and a well-defined population is part of civilized values. Uh, they would uh, <coughs> worry that if you allow immigration, or and that you would uh, you might undermine that, and they would feel very strongly that people who have crossed the border illegally have by definition contributed um, by definition have carried out an illegal act and therefore uh, certainly ought not to be rewarded for it and perhaps ought to be punished for it finally libertarians don't like the idea of government coercion at all uh, and don't see why uh, political borders should have any significance and so they would tend to favor open borders so they um, they would they would see this as a freedom versus coercion issue uh, 
<clears throat> I, I should probably say that uh, I don't think of these axes as some kind of fundamental explanation of why people believe what they do. More, it's an, it predicts how they will be most comfortable expressing their points of view. So a progressive will be most comfortable expressing their point of view on immigration, whatever it is, in terms of how, how it uh, deals with oppressed groups. <clears throat> Conservatives will be most comfortable uh, talking about it in terms of how it affects civilized values versus uh, attacks on civilized values. And libertarians will be most comfortable talking about it in terms of freedom versus coercion. It's how they feel most comfortable talking about it, not necessarily an explanation of why they believe what they believe. And as you argue in the book, and it's part, certainly part of my life experience, which is that people like to hang out with certain types of people that are like themselves typically, a certain tribalism that is true of religion. It's true of politics too, although people don't like to think of it that way, but I think it is a good way to think about it. And um, so we get into the habit of talking to our in inside group, and then when we take that language and confront someone who's on the other side, uh, it's extremely ineffective and they don't get it. Exactly. So you, you know, a libertarian feels like they've played the trump card when they've said – when they've talked about freedom versus coercion and other people just don't think of it as a trump. And similarly, the conservative, when they say – when they've talked – described an issue in terms of civilization versus barbarism – they think that's that's absolutely that's Trump's, and uh, other people disagree. So that <laughs> you get exactly that kind of miscommunication. In some ways, it's worse than that. In, in some in some ways, it's an almost intentional miscommunication. Uh, I, I use the analogy of you know a football quarterback in American football calling an audible, where the intent is for his team to understand it and for the other team not to understand it. And I think. Some of the political discourse almost goes to that level where you're uh, sending <clears> – <throat> by using the axis of your your tribe, you're sort of signaling that you want to raise your status within the tribe uh, and that you don't really care what, what other tribes think. And as a result, because we have trouble seeing uh, the arguments of the other sides, we dismiss them as obviously misguided, foolish, wrong – evil, immoral. Uh, it explains one of the things that I would find very troubling about policy discourse, which is not only am I right and not only you're wrong, but I'm a better person than you are, which is a bizarre outcome for political discourse. But it is the – I'd say it's sort of the default right now. Yeah, and I think uh, part of the use that people make of the axes is that they – ultimately come to think of their opponents in those terms. Like one of the uh, things that I read that, that started me thinking along these lines was a uh, book by, uh, I think it's called like something like In Defense of Libertarianism or something like that by John Brennan. I forget the, we, there are many books with libertarians in the title. But uh, at one point he, <coughs> he says, well, there are two alternative points of view to libertarianism. One of them wants a nanny state and the other one wants a police state. You know, and uh, what he's in effect doing is saying is saying that people who disagree don't have some – he doesn't look at them along their own axis, but he looks at them solely along the freedom versus coercion axis and say they want coercion, uh, whereas you know, they wouldn't describe themselves that way. Similarly, you'll hear people say about libertarians, you know, they just want to – you know. Uh, see people starve. They want to let poor people suffer. And again, that's not how they would describe themselves. That's not how they arrive at their position. But if you, uh, if, if you're trying to simplify the, the world into oppressors <coughs> and oppressed, then it's, uh, it simplifies your world to describe your opponents, whether they're conservatives or libertarians, as oppressors. And then you've, you've kind of, simplified the problem and made them demons. So people demonize their opponents along these axes. So and you'll you'll see conservatives say that uh that you know Obama's actually just a barbarian. You know, he's he's really on the side of the terrorists. He's trying to destroy the and, country. His goal is yeah. to destroy the country. 
and and they'll say that they, that libertarians are doing the same thing to you know by advocating uh you know limiting drug laws and uh you know not doing enough to support the family through government and so on uh but it you know it really goes to the point of of deciding that people who disagree with you don't disagree with you legitimately but they but because they are on the opposite end of your preferred axis which is a place they would not put themselves but since in we have this natural habit your claim is we have this natural habit of dividing the world into two, into one axis really the with one end that's good and one that's bad kind of shove people into the they disagree with us they must be at the other end but they don't they're on the yeah. they're orthogonal to us it turns out yeah and uh, it, it, I, I think it's part of a process of reach, reaching what uh, you know some <coughs> psychologists used to call closure, which is sort of feel, it, you feel that everything's settled uh, when you can dismiss anyone who disagrees with you by just saying, "Oh, well, they're just on the other axis; they're just on the opposite end of my axis. They're they're actually they're you know they're bitter opponents to everything I stand for. They're, they're evil. Rather, yeah, yeah." Yeah, so I've I've often um, you don't sell the ideas in the book this way, but I've often suggested that something along these lines. I didn't think of it the same way, obviously, but that if you want to get people to agree with your worldview, well, I think what most people think the way to do that is you just prove they're wrong, <laughs> and then they'll just throw yeah. up their hands and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, my whole life's been a lie," uh, yeah. and that doesn't work. It doesn't work in proselytizing for religion. It doesn't work for proselytizing for ideology. And so what this book suggests is that if you want to – this is the part I don't think you you talk about explicitly, but it implies that if you want to encourage someone to think the way you do, you ought to put yourself in their shoes and use their axes. Yeah, and and I, or at least understand the legitimate side of their argument rather than uh, try to characterize it in the most illegitimate way. Um, yeah, I, I, I really want to fall short of claiming that you can sort of, you know, this called the three languages of politics, and I want to <laughs> fall short of claiming that by learning to translate into someone else's language, you can suddenly persuade them uh, that you're right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't promise that at all. I, I do think you have a better chance uh, of under, you know, if you understand them, and, but I think you also take the risk that if you understand their language, that they may persuade you. And my guess is, if you don't, you're not willing, to, <laughs> if you're not willing to take that risk, <laughs> then uh, then your chances of persuading someone else are probably less. But you'll have a better marriage if you're married to somebody <laughs> whose axes aren't the same as yours. I mean, my I, I I my claim is again, mine's a simpler claim that I've made in the past, which is that you should be empathetic. You should consider whether your uh, opponent could possibly be right, and by doing so, you might actually learn something and and understand better of how to think the way they do. And my other benefit is it's the right thing to do. You're a nice yeah. person. Why would you enjoy treating your ideological or religious enemies as evil or even even misguided? Is also you know disturbing a, a way to treat another human being. They're smart. Thoughtful, nice. Most of them, not all of them. Some of them are monsters. You're right, but a lot of them are just like you. They're, they have a viewpoint, and they've crammed a lot of facts and, and studies into that viewpoint to convince themselves that, that they're right, just like you do. Yeah, that's. I guess that's a, a difficult way for people to think, and uh, so maybe you know one of the benefits of reading the book is it'll uh, <laughs> make it easier for people to think that way. So how did you choose the axes? Uh, how did you – I mean the idea that there are different worldviews is not a unique idea. What's I think particularly thoughtful about the book and thought-provoking is the axes make sense to me. Now, I, of course, could be – I'm in your camp more or less. I'm in the L camp, the libertarian camp, but uh, – or, or freedom coercion camp sort of mostly – so maybe it's just natural that they would make sense to me, but I do seem to see them around me, those different – the axes of the people who don't agree with me. So how did you come to that idea? Um, well, maybe at some point in my life I've sympathized with all three points of view. Uh, so I kind of was thinking, you know, well, what, was, what did I think back when I was uh, 
you know, a new left anti-Vietnam War uh, liberal, you know, progressive. And what did I think, <coughs> you know, when I, uh, you know, was <coughs> uh, thinking that, you know, George Bush was a, a good president uh, for how he was reacting to 9-11. Um, so maybe I was focused on civilization and barbarism. And by the way, when I think about terrorism, it's pretty hard for me not to think about the civilization versus barbarism on that one. Uh, and then, you know, with but my that, that's, you know, go ahead. Sorry. So, and then, you know, as, as a libertarian, I'm certainly familiar with how, how libertarians speak. And then I just sort of, uh, and I was asking myself, I had this insight, I think, uh, about a year ago, maybe a little more that it seems like so much punditry if you step back and look at it, it, is an attempt not to open the minds of people on your own side or even to open the minds of people on the other side, but it looks like the real purpose is to close the minds of people on your own side. And so then I, then I started to ask myself, well, how would you go about closing the mind of someone on your own side? And say, well, if I were a progressive, how would I try to close the minds of my fellow progressives on the issue. I said, well, if I could frame this as a oppressors and oppressed in a convincing way, then that would make them shut out all disagreement. And similarly, the, with civilization and barbarism uh, for conservatives, <laughs> if I can frame, once I frame that issue that way, uh, A, they'll think I've, I've been really smart, and B, they'll think that they'll feel even more closed on the issue, more settled that they're right, if I can frame it along that axis. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I, I was you know, looking, it's a little bit also like my own experience, like if, if I ever, if, you know, to the extent that I phrased something in freedom versus coercion terms, I would get these tremendous applause from people on the libertarian side and, uh, you know, the opposite from people who coming from different points of view. And so it were those types of things that led me to think that those were the axes. So your examples and that little mini history reminds me of something I don't think you talk about, which is that occasionally there is an issue of oppressed versus oppressors for everybody or civilization versus barbarism for everybody. Right, So the terrorism example is a great example. A lot of people across the political spectrum worry about terrorism, might react to it differently. They might react differently to what policies are justified or should be put in place to stop it. But well, let's look at that. If, 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 I'll, I'll, I don't want to interrupt too much, but, but, let, but let's take the Boston Marathon bombing that took place recently. OK. OK. So let's look, look at the reactions to it. Uh, the Weekly Standard, I think this was a cover piece or lead editorial, was entitled exactly Civilization and Barbarism. I mean, this was just, they felt like this was right in their wheelhouse, and this is exactly what, how you predicted they would react. Um, <clears throat> I think others had great difficulty with it. You had this infamous column uh, in Slate magazine uh, before the, the bombers were identified by a guy saying, boy, I hope it's white male. You know, it's like I hope it's 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 somebody I, that's from the, the certified from the oppressor class. It's yeah. not you know. Uh, right. You had President Obama <laughs> referring to uh, what, what was the term self radicalizing terrorism, as if people you know you or I could walk down the street and all of a sudden poof we just you know we self radicalize. It's like a virus. It no, just it just gets in your bloodstream and then you're stuck. You're off the you're off the track. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> which seems to me like an attempt to avoid avoid talking about it in, in civilization barbarism terms. And finally, uh, many libertarians, you know, used you know talked about the uh, you know were very critical of the lockdown in Boston. You know, said you know this is a police state. There are tanks in the street. This is all this stuff. Um, and <clears throat> I think. Libertarians may have some very valid points going forward about how society reacts. You know, there may be a lot of um, unnecessary and um, civil rights reducing uh, kinds of 
surveillance <coughs> and limitations on people put on as a result of this. So I mean, I'm, I'm not saying libertarians don't have anything to worry about, but uh, I think that this the focus on the lockdown and the uh, actions of the police might very well be inappropriate uh, and is certainly not going to win libertarians any friends because I think most people's reaction in, to the police after the bombing, I mean, before the bombing, you can argue that, that you know, some dots should have been connected that weren't, but that afterward that their conduct was pretty brave and pretty effective. That's, I think that would, that's what most people would say. But I agree with you, and that's a great example. Um, the only point I was trying to make is that Sometimes there are actual issues where the axes apply absolutely directly. You don't have to stretch to make them fit. And in those cases, sometimes people drift into different categories. So there are libertarians and and progressives who were initially in favor of the um, response to 911, right, who supported the war in Iraq because they thought it was a, a blow against um, barbarism, I think. Uh, or maybe just public safety, but I think a lot of people were accepting the conservative axis uh, for temporarily at least, or not temporarily, but for this issue and temporarily as it turned out. But uh, yeah. And similarly, when there's a case of oppressor and oppressed, there are conservatives and libertarians who will spring to to emotional reactions to those issues. I think what makes the the paradigm so powerful is that for most of us, we wedge every issue into these categories, our respective categories. And I think that's what makes it powerful. Yeah, I think that the, the sort of putting them in, in those categories when it's appropriate. I mean, so something like you know using the oppressor oppressed axis to describe the uh, the fight against Jim Crow laws. I think you know is, is perfectly fine, and you can understand why why anyone would do it. But it's when when people, it, it's really noticeable when, pe as you say, when people force issues into that, uh, into that mode. When, when there's just a, most typically when, when, the, when there are just a lot of nuances to the issue, and that you know, if you're really going to think about it carefully, you can't reduce it to those simplistic terms. And you know, besides the fact that it's nice to think of your intellectual opponents or ideological opponents as, as decent human beings. It, in many ways, for me, the the, the book is a um, exerts a calming influence. So when you s see a column or a pundit uh, saying something that is that drives you nuts, because of course it goes against your axis, instead of saying "What a jerk! What a fool! He's evil!" It's interesting to say, "Well, you know, he's got his own little goofy way of looking at the world, yeah, and he sees everything as um, as related to his issue, and you know, you kind of." Pity is not the right word. It's just like you understand it. It's not as offensive as it is if you think they're just crazy or against your view, which is even more maddening. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I, what, what I end up being offended by then, though, are, are, are people who, uh, who, <coughs> not because they look at an issue in a particular way, but jump to clarify, you know, presuming that the other side is evil. Uh, David Brooks had a column about a week ago that I was very sympathetic to, where he talked about a detached point of view versus an engaged point of view. That, that a pundit who's engaged is just, you know, it's just like they're in the, it's like they're, in, you know, in the battle zone and they're, you know, throwing punches, uh, you know, as fast as they can. And detached is they're actually observing and trying to uh, see the. The point of view of both sides, and clearly, the goal in, in Brooks is, I think, arguing that uh, at this point we, we've certainly got a plenty of engaged pundit, pundits. We might be able to use a few more detached ones, and uh, that's that. I would be making a similar point. And then in the part, part, and <coughs> again, a, a goal of the book is to, is to enable you to have some sort of detachment. It reminds me a little bit of the um, uh, earlier insight of yours that I, for some reason, associate that you had from your father, the insider-outsider um, uh, aspect of politics that insiders invest a lot of time and energy, know what they're doing, and 
they were able to make the system work in their direction. And the rest of us are just watching on the outside, not really paying attention so much. And when you think of the world that way, again, I, for me, it's kind of like, well, yeah, what would you expect? That's the way it's going to turn out. And it's not plausible that that our side wins every time or that the good policies always prevail. Well, I think from uh, – if I would try to imagine what my father would say, it would be that the – uh, all of the storm and fury along the three axes is just uh, for show to uh, uh, you know, give people uh, a sense of ownership in the process. And meanwhile, the sober, rational people are in the back rooms dividing up the goodies uh, yeah. and watch, you know, we'll watch watching. So, uh, <coughs> you know, for instance, uh, if you, you know, look at you know, labor unions from, you know, so some, you know, one side looks at it from a, you know, oppressed oppressor point of view and other view says, you know, well, these, you know, these unions are like thugs. So it's a civilization barbarism issue. And, uh, meanwhile, in the back room, the unions are raising wages and the firms are raising prices and everybody else, uh, is kind of, getting less to take as a result that would be kind of the classic insider outsider story the uh all of the ide- you know ideological stuff is uh uh is is just to keep the uh, keep the outsiders entertained and and distracted it's the window dressing it just yeah uh, it's circus uh you make an analogy between your three kinds of language and the Meyer Briggs test now explain that analogy and Explain what Myers Briggs is for people who don't know what it is. Okay, uh, Myers Briggs is a personality uh, test that's always been more popular in the business world than in sort of academic psychology. So I got to put that caveat out there. Um, and what it 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 uh, <laughs> it gets it tests your propensity on things like introversion versus extroversion or uh intuition versus facts and <laughs> things like that and uh the use that business people that's made in the business world is that uh in in a business uh complex organization you need all t- sorts of people you need detailed people you need big big picture people you need people who uh like to uh mull things over and you people you need people who like to who want to see decisions made and made made quickly you need so you you need these different types of people and they um they often don't get along uh somebody who's you know very intuitive doesn't have the patience for somebody who's very detailed somebody who's very detailed doesn't respect the person who's intuitive because they they, they just can't follow their crazy leaps and they think they and they see all the mistakes they make uh with details <laughs> so these people their natural tendencies to not get along and the idea of the Myers Briggs training is to first of all uh you take a test and you you see where 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 your tendencies are and then you learn insights into other people's tendencies and you you become more tolerant of them and so uh, that's kind of a long story, and the analogy with the book is that I'm hoping that if you can uh, <laughs> see which tendencies you might have and, and understand the tendencies of other people, that uh, it would be easier to get along with people who have different tendencies. Well, I think it's I think it's true, uh, and I think the personality difference. Just to yeah, I know it's not scientific. That's why it doesn't get. I'm putting scientific in giant quotes. Because uh, very little is scientific in my mind, but uh, so I don't make that big a distinction between Myron Briggs and and academic psychology. But the idea would be that you know somebody who is um, obsessed with getting their to dos checked off versus somebody who doesn't keep a to do list and sort of is always flying, uh, doing things at the last minute and figuring out things on the fly. And each of those people looks at the other one like like they're crazy. Like, yeah, I can't believe you don't keep a to-do list. I mean, how do you get your job test done? Oh, I was, you know, I, I well, and some things fall through the cracks. What? And the, the obsessive person is, which is a slightly derogatory term, right? 
the detail oriented yeah. person, the person who's focused on the tasks, uh, can't understand that other person. The other person thinks, what's wrong with, what's wrong with that person? All they care yeah. about is their little to do list. They don't even have time to think and, and, and ponder and, and do the big picture stuff. And, and it, when you think about how, that challenge of interacting, especially if you're doing a project together, which is why businesses care about this stuff and organizations care about it. Um, and the, the political thing is is not that different. It's very similar. And a lot of – I've noticed that in a lot of organizations, political attitudes spill into personality traits and, and you know, organizational policy. Wow. I mean I – it's been a while since I've been in a big organization, but uh, uh, you know I I do see alarming signs of sort of politics taking over things like I, know, I mean maybe it's just me, but it seems like you know more Facebook posts that I see, and these are from people who I don't think of as being in my sort of <coughs> academic slash political circles. There, there's they're all political posts on Facebook. It's, uh, it's, uh, Meaning that they're just more politicized. Yeah, I mean, well, I've just you know, it's Facebook. You should be, you know, stereotypically, people should be, you know, putting up pictures of themselves drunk at parties. Of course, you know, the people I'm friends with are too old for that. But uh, it's still, <laughs> in some ways, this is worse. <laughs> yeah, I don't think actually. I don't think. Yeah, I think that stereotype of Facebook and Twitter is just is not true. I think it's just. A different blogging platform, and now people who normally wouldn't even bother starting a blog are using their Facebook and Twitter accounts for their blogging. But um, anyway, moving on. Uh, one thing I thought of as I was reading the book was uh, Thomas Sowell's book, A Conflict of Visions, which is a fabulous book. Mm -hmm. And you refer to it at, in, in, when you're talking about other similar viewpoints. Talk about Sowell's vision um, in that book and how it relates to yours. Oh, that's a – Good question. So, um, so the, the the terms that stand out are unconstrained vision and constrained vision. So, a in his view, <laughs> a conservative has a constrained vision. So, very aware of the limits of human nature, the limits of resources, and things like that. And uh, the limits of then, reason, the limits of experts, limits of lots of things. Yeah. Yeah. You probably uh, you might very well be do do a better job than I could summarizing that, and the unconstrained vision uh, just says, in some sense, yeah. You know, um, there's, there's a quote that I'll probably get wrong from Robert Kennedy. Uh, some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream dreams that never were and ask why not. That would be sort of an unconstrained vision. Dream dreams that never were and ask why not. Um, Utopian. Yeah. Um, so that um, um, uh, having, having said that, I think a difference between Soul's view and, and my view is, is Soul, I think, is is really trying to get at why people believe that they do you know why do progressives believe what they do because and he would say it's because they have this unconstrained vision and conservatives believe what they do because they have this constrained vision uh i very much am not claiming to explain why people believe what they do that is a, it isn't because you uh focus on oppression of, and oppressed that you have your progressive point of view. I'm saying that it's part of the process of how you believe what you believe or how you process your beliefs, how you express them, and how you respond to the way other people express beliefs. It's, um, you know, I, I think that conservatism, libertarianism, progressivism are all very complex belief systems. And there's a lot, you know, there's just a lot more going on than the, just these three axes. But I think that the three axes are kind of what people use to kind of, you know, <clears throat> like magnetic poles to kind of line up their side uh, versus other, versus their opponents. It's the, uh, it's you know, like the a set of cheers or taunts that they use. 
uh, to uh, whip up tribal solidarity. That, that is, so it, it's not a so so. It, whereas I think soul is attempting to explain why people believe what they do. I'm talking more about the process by which people kind of uh, push for tribal solidarity in what they believe. So in in the back of the book, you have a little appendix where you go through some pundits and try to see how well the theory, the model, the idea explains what they write about and how they write about it. It strikes me that a maybe a more another interesting way of examining the usefulness of the model would be to look at um, political conventions, particularly the non prime time people, which I occasionally watch for as a source of humor and um, I don't know, academic interest and in how easy or hard it is to motivate a large group of people. I find it interesting to see how well and badly uh, people do at that. But my thought would be that when you look at the two major parties, a lot of their um, warm-up acts for the keynotes uh, operate along your axes. I think that'd be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but that would be uh, – that sounds absolutely right, that that would be a situation in which your main goal is kind of uh, whipping up the tribe. It's sort of like the locker room speech of, of a, at a football before a football game, and uh, that's when you would expect people to really use these axes the most. So that would be a, that would be a good uh, test of this. So, why did you write this book? Did you, was your goal? I mean, obviously there are many goals, but was your goal simply to? Um, you suggested a minute ago it was to improve political discourse and tolerance. Is that is that your goal? Um, good question. <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think I think that's something. I think part of the motive is to get people to back off from the point of demonizing those who disagree as as if they were on the other side of the of the preferred axis. So if we could get libertarians to stop thinking of <clears throat> of conservatives and progressives as wanting coercion, loving power, that kind of thing. You know, they want power. But Arnold, they that's do. what they're all about. Arnold, they do. That's what they're about. <laughs> yeah. It's hard uh, not to if, sometimes it's hard to keep out of the yeah, sorry. Just kidding. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and if you know, to get progressives you know, similarly to get progressives to not think of 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 um you know every you know, libertarianism is a dog whistle for racism or whatever they they accuse it of being and forget well, no 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 libertarian no libertarianism <laughs> is for rich people it's okay. to help rich people yeah. get really rich and stay rich that's what libertarians are in the progressive yeah. worldview uh yeah you know, so <laughs> yeah so you get the point that that uh if if we could get if we could re just reach the point where we don't automatically demonize people, then I, I think uh, the, the book will have, would have accomplished something. So, of course, one theme that runs through the book is confirmation bias, uh, which we all suffer from. And I was reminded of the Richard Feynman quote, which is, the most important principle is not to fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Uh, it strikes me that we fool ourselves a lot along these lines um, and cherish being fooled because it's it's a good cozy feeling to be part of the tribe. Yeah, um, I think that that uh, <clears throat> yeah, the book discusses a number of of sort of findings in kind of the psychology of political belief, including confirmation bias, which is a very important one. That um, I think are, are reasons that to be aware of the three axis model because I think people uh, use these axes in, uh, in ways to um, – I, I think it promotes bias thinking. I, I, you know, there's a lot of um, – you know, everyone want, wants to talk about, you know, predictable irrationality and, you know, the uh, – you know, thinking fast and slow, all these findings that suggest that we cannot reason very well. And, 
I think I, I think we, I have this faith that we ha- have something that I call constructive reasoning, where we can actually look at things objectively and not uh, and not from an entirely biased point of view. And I call that a faith because it's sort of the, the, the psychology seems to always go the other way. Um, and I think people can reason more constructively if they can uh, not automatically react along these axes. I guess I could accuse you of being somewhat – having a somewhat unconstrained vision, right? Is that, yes, is, is right. that, there's not much that's more quixotic than trying to improve political discourse. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. I'll grant you that. Um, let's, uh, let's turn to our home team, not the libertarian part of it, but the, um, the economist part. Uh, we're both trained as economists, and I am particularly disturbed. Uh, by the nature of economic political debate or political economy debate, whatever you want to call it, the policy uh-huh. debate that economists are engaged in. Um, how do you see your axes playing out in uh, economic policy among economists? Wow. OK, that's a good question. I'll probably have a, an excellent answer a few hours from now after I've mulled it. Well, you can blog um, on it and we'll put a link up to it when we run this in a couple of weeks. So you, can, you have a couple of weeks to, to mull on it. But give us give us your quick thought. Yeah, the off the cuff uh, story. Um, I think that uh, one thing that this uh, – that the three axes might – enable one to do is to recognize an economic argument from an axis argument. So uh, if a progressive economist uh, starts writing in oppressor-oppressed terms, uh, you can say, well, okay, you're entitled to to say that, but at that point you are speaking from outside the economic paradigm because that's not really the economic paradigm unless you're, you know, unless you're actually a literal Marxist, which I don't think... uh, Typical, most pundits. I don't think any pundits really genuinely subscribe to that. Um, and uh, similarly, if um, if a conservative economist starts to write in along civilization barbarism terms, that's a sign that they've sort of vacated the their economic thinking for a moment and have uh, switched to something else. So maybe that would be one application of the model. I noticed she didn't say anything about the libertarian economists. Uh, <laughs> well, that's an actually the libertarians probably are more into their more often slipping into their axis than anybody else, right? Uh, because uh, <laughs> you know, li- well, we're talking about government intervention, right? So once you do that, yeah, naturally, and, and yeah, so so when when a libertarian says that, you know, makes a a, you know, sort of a Hayekian argument about lack of information, or a Friedman argument about people making better choices for themselves than the choices they make for others. Those, those, I think, are economic arguments. When you, but you can see a libertarian economist uh, sort of put on his, you know, full-on libertarian clothes and start talking about, uh, you know, this is, you know. Uh, Taxes collected at gunpoint. Uh, at that point, they've they've taken off their economic clothes. That might be a way of. Well, I thought you were going to say that Friedman. That example of Friedman was an example of the axis because it's hard to distinguish between people spending their own money on themselves and people spending other money's other people's money on other people from the freedom coercion argument. But uh, maybe. Right, well, if you think of it as choices, you know, where where the, where do the choices get made? Um, you, you can make a, you know, without saying that it's freedom versus coercion. I mean, you can just, you can say that, um, you know, <clears throat> I voluntarily, uh, have government tell me, you know, which side of the road to drive on, you know, no problem there. Uh, then, you know, I just so easily could say I voluntarily, uh, have government decide how to educate my children. Yeah, that's you know you, you can say that, or you, or you can certainly say that the essence 
I think most people other than libertarians wouldn't say that the essence of public schools is coercion. That's not the essence of them. And mo and most people, including Milton Friedman even, w w would say that, that what fundamentally is wrong about the way our public school system works isn't so much the coercion, it's the monopoly. It's that you know, if people had more choices and could, uh, to use the familiar exit versus voice terminology, if they had more opportunity to exit, they would that would lead to better schools just as it leads to better grocery stores when people have the option to exit there. So I see that as sort of a, you know, something that's grounded in economics, whereas saying, if you say, you know, public schools are just tools of the state to get the state to have obedient citizens, you may or may not be right about that, but you're not making an economic argument. So I think it's interesting for people who are listening at, at home, or wherever you are, uh, how often when Arnold said that about coercion isn't the essence of the public school system, did you think to yourself, well, yes, it is, in which case maybe you've learned something about yourself, right? It could be true, by the way. I don't want to suggest that it's false. But what I find fascinating about these issues is, is how hard it is, how difficult it is to step outside your own paradigm and how easy it is to see the world through your particular kind of glasses, the kind of glasses that we've become accustomed to wearing. And I, I find that I find that fascinating. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see people's reactions to some of that stuff. Right. And let me give you another um, application or way to think about it with um, with economists. You're re when I asked you this question, you said, well, you'd have to look and see do the economists, do they step into the axis, meaning they take off their economist hat more or less. But of course, the temptation is to do that, right? If you only talk the economics, you're just – you're not going to get any any fans. If you want to get uh, the crowd cheering for you, if you want to get your tribe riled up and, and, and you want to be carried around the arena on their shoulders, uh, if you just say things like, well, I think the elasticity of demand for labor is 0.7, not 0.75 – or more accurately, not 1.3. Uh, but what you do is you take your economics argument and then you shove it into one of these paradigms. And that's what makes uh, makes you popular. Well, sad to say, I, I think that there's, there's a lot to that. I think one of the things is about if you uh, – if, if you uh, discipline yourself – never to you know leave the economist camp and to never uh rely on on these axes then i think uh your abil your ability to have high status within a camp uh will will be diminished or will or just won't be there um <laughs> you know that's why i think sort of someone like you know Gary Becker, who writes well, writes on policy issues, um, you know, has a blog that I don't know how many followers it has, but probably he has one hundredth of the followers of of a Paul Krugman, and yet, you know, they're both Nobel Prize winners. I'd say if anything, Becker does more economics on his blog, but I don't I don't think he's as willing to. Uh, play to any one of the axes as Krugman would be. Yeah, I, without picking on particular people, I, I do think that there are um, there are folks who, as you say, have have a lot to say, and you can learn from if that's your goal. Uh, who aren't as prominent, of course, that isn't always our goal. Sometimes our goal is just to get a good, cathartic um, read and and feel good about ourselves or bad about the other side, and that's a different. It's a different intellectual, different product. Yeah, and that, but I, I think that, you know, to me, um, you know, I really care about that, um, about style, you know, that, you know, uh, so I really appreciate the, uh, <coughs> I appreciate most the economists who try to uh, stay away from the uh, arguing along the axes, and I think that 
Uh, and I will pick on Krugman because I do think he sets a horrible example in that regard. I mean, in his success uh, is not, uh, I don't think it's been a healthy thing for economists. It gives you an impression of what, uh, of how to succeed that I think uh, <coughs> takes you away from uh, talking like an economist. So when I think about that, about the uh, incentives, that we face and of course you and I we're in this market in a very modest way we blog we write policy books uh we appear on podcasts and when i think about what to do about it my thought is well you know the incentives all work toward what i said a minute ago toward playing to the crowd and the axis and and finding a home along those uh, along an axis that that uh, is pleasant and comfortable it's hard to imagine that this is going to change. That that world's going to change. I, I, I mean, I see your book mainly as a self help book, um, it, it, as a way to improve the way you think about yourself, and to some extent, maybe to help some others. Of course, <laughs> there's always a tendency <laughs> to say, "Well, I don't have this problem here. You need to read this book. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm fine." Uh, but, but it, it yeah, one it, of my, yeah, one of my li- I, I agree with the self help. No, Shane. One of my lines in the book is that you know you really have no business pronouncing someone else unreasonable. The only person you're qualified to say is unreasonable is you. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, but you know when we think about what's gone on in economics in the last few weeks, we had this little problem where um, a couple of researchers left a line out of a spreadsheet. Uh, that was their main error. Uh, I'm talking about Ryan Hart and Rogoff, yeah. of course. Uh, they had. They had written a paper about the relationship between public debt and GDP growth, and um, when someone, a group of scholars, tried to replicate their work, they couldn't do it. And one of the reasons they couldn't is they'd forgotten a line. And uh, when they included the line in the spreadsheet, changed the results. Not not a trivial amount, but they changed. It didn't didn't overturn the results, but it, it did reduce their their impact. And the firestorm that followed was. It's really extraordinary. What was your reaction to that? Um, well, it, I have – I think that – that, and this will be um, – it may sound whiny, but I think that um, that conservative scholars are given much less margin of error in the world. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you take Elizabeth Warren's research, which I think would embarrass some undergraduates, uh, she gets a free pass or, or praise in the media. Um, and, but, but I, I just, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm being narrow, but I, I think that it's it's amazing to me how many of these firestorms seem to involve people who stray from left wing orthodoxy, um, and how people and that people who subscribe to left wing orthodoxy seem to have be have, have a Teflon coating in the media. I guess you know, that's it's a it's a paranoid point of view. And maybe if I watched you know Fox News you know take on climate scientists or something i would i would you know be paranoid from that point of view but um actually i wouldn't be because i'm not i'm not a climate science believer don't tell anybody um <laughs> oh good thing uh, don't but, worry nobody listens to econ talk arnold your secret's safe with me <laughs> good <laughs> but um the um you know so so uh, maybe i, I may, maybe I, i'm Seeing that narrowed, but that that that's that was the main impact I had. That part of it is that the that ninety percent thing when I first saw it in Reinhardt and Rogoff. Explain. Was, oh no. Ex- explain oh, that. No. no. Explain that. Okay. Okay. Right. What it is? Okay. So supposedly, so so the way it's been read in the media, and I don't, and and maybe they intended this, and if they did, that's they deserve some opprobrium for that, regardless of the spreadsheet error. Uh, but the interpreted media made it sound like, well, you can run a debt to GDP ratio that's pretty high, but once you get to 90%, 
you're going to have really bad impacts on economic growth. It's like there's this like this speed limit of 90% debt to GDP ratio. And that looked to me like to be in a class of statistical findings that just highly suspect. I mean, it, it can't be it, it's just not a good way to think about that issue. Um, so I, I reacted to that negatively when I first saw it. So uh, I didn't, so I, maybe I just assumed that other people didn't make a big deal of it, but, but other people clearly did. I just opened up a book the other day where, you know, on page five, they, you know, the, you know, these are <laughs> conservative economists and they pound on that 90% number. You know, we're, you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff have shown that, you know, if the debt to GDP ratio hits 90%, then research shows you know, horrible things happen. And, uh, and again, that's, uh, for me, that's just, that's just a class of findings that's, uh, not, uh, I wouldn't have trusted from the get go. Um, it was just, uh, and just not even a good way to think about it. But, um, so maybe, you know, maybe this controversy in some sense is legitimate. Maybe there were conservatives who really did, you know, <clears throat> base all of their policy arguments on this, um, I guess I have a hard time seeing that because because I would never have, you know, I would I, I don't think I've I've ever cited that number as you know. No, it's bizarre. Not the way. It's bizarre. Yeah. But on the flip side, I just interviewed uh, Austin Fract on the Oregon Medicaid study, mm-hmm. and it seems to me that we're having a similar pundit explosion, blogosphere explosion, uh, overreacting to one study. So. The Reinhardt Rogoff thing's wrong, therefore any kind of debt's allowed. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter what yeah, the rate is right, now. Right, right, right. Yeah, because they're yeah. wrong. It's like there, there, there is no, there, there is no limit to how much yeah. debt you can well, have. because they're, they're wrong, and and because yeah. they made an error. Right, um, right. And uh, although it's interesting, no one has, as far as I know, no one has accused them of deliberately making an error. Of of they, right. they've, they've accused them of of negligence, but not malfeasance, um, yeah. and not fraud. But the Medicaid thing is similar. You know, it, there are some results for the pro Medicaid side, but most of the results are for the anti Medicaid side. So now it's, well, Medicaid doesn't have any effect. Okay, we can, we can eliminate it. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a little um, bit of overreaction. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, it would be nice if you could get some kind of, and I think you could get kind of a sober consensus that, um, I, I, to me, the significance of the Medicaid study is a lot of people will argue that the reason you want to have comprehensive health insurance is that the small procedures that you subsidize will down the road save you money because people will have taken better care of themselves. And <laughs> that is the argument that I believe is threatened by the Medicaid study. And I think be able to have a sober discussion about whether comprehensive insurance uh, – uh, I, I, comprehensive insurance is, is the only legitimate form of insurance or whether catastrophic health in, insurance would be better. And, um, you know, I'm, I think – uh, Kathleen Sebelius, the head of HHS, was quoted a few weeks ago to the effect of saying that, you know, <clears throat> people who, you know, that, you know, catastrophic health insurance is, is just an evil, you know, that it's just, you know, it, people, people need comprehensive. And I, th- I would hope that, that any economist would at least look at this and say, well, it did not support one of the one of the main arguments for comprehensive health insurance, which is that subsidizing people to spend on the little things will cause them down the road to uh, have less long term expensive illnesses. But it doesn't refute that. I mean, it was only a two year study, so it's not right. Right, it's suggestive. Uh, it didn't. But, it didn't confirm that view. Right. Right. No. No. I. I. I don't want to. Right. I don't want to overstate what it accomplished but you know it, they did focus a lot on these on people who had 
these chronic illnesses like diabetes to sort of see in particular whether it made a difference there. Um, and then you also have to look at in the context of lots and lots and lots of studies that showing different groups of people with different levels of healthcare spending and not different outcomes. I mean, the, the, it, it, if this were the only study that found that, I think you would just throw it out as an outlier. But in fact, it's what every study shows. I mean, there's that you know, great paper by Robin Hanson that just yeah. walks through all of them. And, uh, you know, uh, and even since Robin wrote his paper, Amy Finkelstein did a study of the introduction of Medicare because it, you, looking at different states, because some states in 1965 already had coverage for the elderly, others didn't. She finds the same thing, no difference in outcomes. Um, you know, that I think it's in that context that you, um, that you, you have to see the study as kind of one more straw. Well, to come full circle, I was once speaking to a group of journalists and we we're talking about health care and in a very general way. And this was years ago. This is well before Obamacare. And, um, I think I was probably saying something like, oh, don't we care more about health care than health insurance? Something like that. And somebody challenged me and I said, well, didn't the RAND study show that? And the, you know, what the RAND study showed is that at different levels of subsidies, the people who got a bigger subsidy to health care insurance or health care purchase used more health care, but their health care outcomes weren't much better. I think had no, there was no difference. So I just mentioned that as I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, I, I'm not a health economist. It's just something I knew about and it seemed interesting. And he got furious. Really, he started yelling at me. And he said, uh, the Rand study, and to him, that was – he, he probably said this literally. He said, that's, that's code, those are code words. That means you don't care about poor people getting health care insurance. That's just like – that's like – and now, you know, that's really what your point of your book is, is that he's on that axis and I was on some other axis. I don't know what axis I was on, Mars. I don't know, but um, I defended him. I didn't just – he didn't just go, oh, that's interesting. I guess that I got maybe I should rethink my position. Strangely enough, he didn't think that way. He got mad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the uh, one of the studies I cite in my book, and it's it's sort of a controversial study, and maybe it needs to be replicated in a lot of different ways before it, it deserves to be cited. It's probably been cited a lot more than it's been replicated. Uh, it says that you if you take two people who come into uh, a position with a strong viewpoint, and you show them the same facts, each of them strengthens their own viewpoint. <laughs> uh, and that's which, too sweet, isn't it? I, it, does, it, does, it makes you worry, wonder whether it's true, but it is, it's delicious. Yeah. That yeah, could um, be true. So <laughs> that, that's certainly frightening. And, and it's, that's consistent, I think, with, um, some you know classic political science research, which says that um, you know the that elites, political elites are, are more polarized than political masses. So the more informed you are, the more polarized you are. You know that might be an intuitive position, but you could see that being a counterintuitive position. That is, wow, you'd think that if people learned more, they would converge. Uh, but the, <coughs> the you know, but there's a a correlation between level of knowledge and degree of polarization. Hmm. And that's been true for, you know, that was first discovered in the early 1960s. Uh, I think the problem problem is now they're more It's even more worse. Informed. Well, yeah, so it's even <laughs> more polarized. <laughs> My guest today has been Arnold Klang. Arnold, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Okay, thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.